My next guest has built an incredible career across banking and technology to be named one of Africa's 1,000 most powerful women by Phenomenal African Woman. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the Systemic Logic Group, a global consulting and technology firm with a leading edge in innovation and emergent business strategy. Prior to being appointed as CEO of Systemic Logic, she served as the Head of Inclusive Banking at the Standard Bank Group, which generated just under 5 billion rand as the largest affordable housing lender in the market. Her division was awarded the 2013 BAI uh, Financial Global Banking Innovation Award for Innovation in Society and community impact, and during her tenure as Chief Executive of uh, the Group Strategic Services at Liberty Life, uh, the organization was ranked number one for two years in a row at the annual Corporate Research Foundation uh, Best Employer Awards. Uh, she's also uh, an independent non-executive director on the Pick and Pay Board, one of the top supermarket chains in South Africa, and uh, her name is Audrey Matupi, CEO of Systemic Logic. Audrey, welcome to Business Talk on Business Tech, South Africa's largest business news website. It's just such a great pleasure to have you on the platform. Thank you, Michael. The pleasure is mine, and I'm not sure about that intro. <laughs> <laughs> you've certainly achieved an awful lot in your career, Audrey, and uh, you've, you're very vocal around issues of leadership and, and strategy, and you are of the opinion that people build companies, not technology or digital processes. Uh, can you just run through what that means, particularly in a time of, of crisis and uncertainty and where COVID feels like it's really just accelerated this technology trend that was building up prior to the pandemic. Thank you, Michael. And uh, people being the keeper, if you look at what COVID has done for us at the moment, has really brought us all back in touch with the things that matter. Um, at, about five years ago, we were in a business show talking about the power of people and how people drive and accelerate your revenue, optimize your cost and mitigate your risk. Um, people it's actually but the strategies, we've got strategies in place. And now with COVID it makes that conversation easier. We, we do know that um, we all, the whole world came to a standstill. The whole world had to do things differently. So uh, the, the digital component and the technology enables that growth, but you can't do that without people. And leadership starts with knowing and understanding how to harness the power and the energy of every single person in an organization from the top to the bottom, not just the top, to get things done. Uh, in March 2020, a lot of companies felt that when they had to uh, shut down, lock down, and people had to work from home as we are doing at the moment. That meant that uh, there was no one uh, supervising, there was no one uh, collecting and understanding what every single person so you had to trust. So you trust in the person and you trust that the strategy yes, that you put in place will be executed. So the, every single uh, big corporation and competing corporations, funny enough, Michael, over the years, I've found that the strategies are almost very similar. So if you take banking, all banks have the same strategy. Yeah. If you take a retail, all retailers have the same strategy, or even hospitals today, um, whether it's um, access to finance, whether it's saving lives, or whether it's providing food and food security. What is different is the speed of execution and, and the power of the people that you've got. So the real differentiator, funny enough, is as a people. I could have two data scientists, one um, in bank A and one in bank B, uh, a data scientist that's curious enough and constantly looking to challenge themselves to the next level, they will take things to another level and execute in a way that allows you to be competitive uh, versus a data scientist who's just executing on processes because a leader has said, I need those 10 activities completed today. So I'm a, I'm a believer, I have been for many years, and the power and the energy that you harness as a leader in driving uh, change, driving profitability, using people's capabilities and using a leadership style that taps into the potential of the individual. And it speaks to a much more engaged leadership style that uh, to be able to understand that strategy execution, as you said, really hinges and rests on the people who are ultimately going to take that strategy and drive it forward. Uh, who are those people are going to run through walls for you, who are going to innovate, who are going to disrupt? And I think practically every startup, uh, particularly fintechs in recent years, like to say that they're disrupting. It's one of those uh, much overused sort of business buzzwords. Uh, but we do live in those sorts of times. And 
I think most companies have been forced to self-disrupt to survive the pandemic and and to uh, advance and exit from the pandemic as well, to create survival strategies and, and new business models and look for new opportunities. Uh, what strategies are you seeing in the market and how successful have local businesses been in this regard? Michael, I, I like that you talk about the disruption and how anybody uses that. I also recall probably almost 10 years ago, I used to use the word uh, self-disrupt and you have to be out there disrupting. But if you look at and accelerate where we are and what's happening and what I'm seeing with other companies, it's that whole constant, we've been forced to evaluate our business processes, our applications, our products, our processes, meaning that we've been, we actually are forced in a situation. So disruption is that situation where you have to say, how can I leverage my processes to get more out mm -hmm. of this? Mm -hmm. And how do I actually look for new sources of revenue? How do I come up with new products uh, that are out there? Small, if I look at the innovations happening now, um, quite a few companies and the small businesses are becoming more innovative and trying to disrupt differently. So if I take the, the, the industry, for example, of uh, restaurants and catering as an example, which, is, which in itself as a small business, there are quite a multiple um, um, layers downstream of jobs created, et cetera. To, for the last two years, I've observed a process of digitizing, meaning that I've observed for the first time a process of industries coming online that technically weren't. So when people spoke about Uber Eats a while ago, there's certain high-end uh, restaurants that would never have considered getting themselves into Uber Eats. So the digitization and entering the digital economy is, is a way of disrupting yourself. So your product is the same, but you're now coming online and you're showcasing your product differently. So chefs who typically, as an example, would have been in the back end are now seen running cooking, cooking schools or showcasing their product or, or, or posting their products on Instagram or Facebook, yeah. et cetera. That's a form of disruption because you're putting yourself and in, in a space that is uncomfortable, but you're also targeting a new market and you're creating a new product, whether it's an educational product, you're no longer just a chef, you're educating, but more important, you're hoping to generate new sources of revenue uh, through exposing your, your expertise and your skill, which is no longer just the food that you cook, but the knowledge and experience and expertise that you have as a well-renowned, highly rated chef, as an example. So small business, every single small business, and I use that as an example, away from banking example, retail example, because that's real. Uh, we are sitting with our restaurants today that have been told they can only uh, serve food for takeaway. They can't have sit-down operations. But we're seeing more and more cooking shows. So more and more uh, people that are at home have been introduced to a new way of, of, of bringing that five-star experience home. I've seen um, chefs beyond the digital component extend themselves and disrupt by offering services where they can deliver. They can come and set up a three-course or five-course meal for you um, and, and, and your friends. I will, and, and you can go online on a Zoom call and be connected in a Michelin experience wow. away from a restaurant that was a Michelin star restaurant. So small businesses out there have to think differently about the processes that they currently drive, about the products that they're putting forward, around the applications, and even more important, around the connectivity to the customer. So the digital economy, the disruption is made possible and enabled through a world that we call of technology that's out there. For most people, they'll say, yes, social media is good, it's bad, et cetera. But actually, even in the social media platforms, allow small businesses to sell their products. So yeah. think out of the box and think of ways to reach that customer uh, in a way that you can hopefully continue to maintain your revenue stream or increase that revenue stream. Well, that's it, or potentially find new revenue streams, as you say. And it uh, reminds me of my physiotherapist who, during the first lockdown, uh, couldn't see uh, any of her clients. So she started to deliver uh, these videos to uh, to clients that you could end up subscribing to, teaching you how to do Pilates, all, all these home exercises and stretches, and everyone was confined to home. And she saw rapid growth uh, from that. And it's something that she's kept going, uh, even when the economy opened up again. So you, you've got to look at things through through fresh eyes. What does it take from a leadership perspective, though? And I want to come back to that uh, that point that you raised, though, because I think for, for leaders in this environment, it is proving a challenge 
even for the largest organizations. I was chatting to the CEO of First Rand the other day, Alan Pulinger, and he said, you know, Michael, one of the toughest things in this Zoom and Teams environment is building culture for me. And I can't wait to have my people back or certain teams at least with their feet under the desk because I'm finding onboarding uh, new staff very difficult. So what are the leadership traits or, or tips and techniques that leaders need to be aware of to succeed and ready to thrive in this environment? It's a, it's a good point. And um, the starting point as a leader is remembering that you're also human. So when we all found ourselves at home, the routine was broken. So as a leader, if you f- you're feeling disconnected around the routine having been broken, you can imagine yeah. a single team member is disconnected. And I found some of the quick tips were trying to look at the upside around the time that you, you, you have now gained. So a lot of the leaders, most of us would have spent a lot of time commuting to meetings or in back-to-back meetings, and there was very little time to think. Um, um, I love Nancy Klein's book around time to think because um, most leaders talk about have, creating time to think but don't actually act on that time to think. So a very quick tip and a simple tip is identify the time that you've actually gained out of commuting that allows you the time to think, and then find, find ways of now using that time to generate new ideas to actually encourage your teams. So a simple thing that I did last year when we found ourselves in lockdown in March, I realized that I actually have more time to get online and have conversations, brainstorming conversations with my leaders, my, my team leads, because usually my engagement leads are the client and effectively they're almost end up being anyone in the service industry knows that your engagement leads and your top teams end up spending more time with your client because they have to generate a service of value for you. Yeah. But now we have time. We have time to actually sit and have something similar to a fireside chat, but it's an ideation session. Mm. So you can have ideation sessions where you, for the first time, can stop to listen away from the strategy, Michael, because you're ideating for change and the ideation session can be structured or unstructured. So as leaders, it's a quick, it's a quick win. It's fun. And funny enough, it will also allow you to f- feel a little bit more connected to your team members than you were previously. Yeah. We, we, we operated in a mechanical transactional process of ticking the box around the meetings, making tough decisions. And you, the day cycle went through, uh, the, da- the, the, the gatekeepers managed the diaries very well. And you forgot that there's, there are gems sitting around the table. So I've created that space. I've created ideation sessions online as a tip. The second thing as a leader and I've found would be useful in this day and age is to, you, you actually have time to read more. Mm-hmm. So dare to read. I love reading. And, but I used to get frustrated that I could not find time to do that. And reading everything from biographies to just reading the Financial Times to understanding what, what Michael is saying, what's your latest podcast and what, what was the business leader that you interviewed? What were they talking about? What, what's that new word that we're learning? So find ways of doing that because um, you can integrate that in the conversation with your team members. The third tip that I've found is um, finding a way of having meetings that are quick from a client point of view, I found time to have the same ideation sessions with my CEO clients, meaning that we no longer have a timed half an hour, an hour session mm-hmm. where I say to them, let's just get on the call on Zoom and have a talk. Let's have a conversation about you. Let's talk about the things you're worried about from a business point of view, from a family point of view, yeah. and allow, allow, allow your clients to stretch their minds. So if you're in the service industry, provide that service, provide an ideation session, provide a fireside chat. And in terms of new products, I've found that uh, we have innovated, funny enough, during this process uh, with, with new products, because by default, once you start ideating, you start realizing where you've got opportunity, uh, you start realizing where the inefficiencies are, and more important, you empower more. So I've found the distance and the space that's provided by not being in the office means that when you then challenge one of your team members or staff around an idea that the, that's come through, you challenge them, but you also empower them because you're disconnected. So we're having a conversation now. When the person logs off, they're affirmed, first of all, by a CEO who they barely, rarely see and able yeah. to have a conversation with about that. They are heard because you're able to allow them space to communicate what they're thinking. And then they're empowered to go and test that idea 
and, and execute. So in, in this journey, I, I think in two years time, we're going to find um, a lot of companies will introduce new products, new processes, simplified processes, because what the digital economy is allowing us to do is to be more connected. But at the same time, it's allowing us also to be aware of the areas of duplication that we sat mm -hmm. with, that we were not familiar to, because we were in this rat mill running through strategies for execution. Yeah, and it reminds me of uh, Richard uh, Sutton in The Stress Code and his follow-up book, where he talks about how we balance these competing demands of what, what we're looking for is an affirmation in the workplace that helps us deal with the many stresses. And one of those key affirmations is that empowerment that you spoke of, of uh, connecting with your employees and empowering them uh, via ideation to say, right, um, we're going to put it out to you on the on the shop floor. Uh, I know Toyota did that very uh, successfully and is used in all the MBA case studies as well as a way of tapping into that human capital that you mentioned earlier. Now, I think for many businesses, and I love the fact that you use the example of, of the restaurant industry, because I think it is that one industry that is very real. It's tangible for all of us. So we connect with it. Our mom and pop, our favorite restaurant down the road um, may have closed during this period. Uh, for many they've survived and they've reset post lockdown. This almost becomes an opportunity without even have to, having to launch a new product or service to say that, hey, I'm still here. Do, do you agree with that? Uh, how do you view it? I, I fully agree. And I'm going to come back actually to your first question around how we lead, uh, whether it's the technology or the people. So if we look at um, one of the ways in which we remain connected traditionally was the sense of community. So our small businesses all around us, your neighborhood, favorite shop or the deli, or it doesn't matter whichever one you pick and choose, mm -hmm. there's a community that, that was connected to that. And I've found that um, those that have survived, first and foremost, pat yourself on the shoulder because that's it's been a very, very tough and stressful journey for most of us. There was a Goldman Sachs um, 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 survey that was done uh, last year, and I think about 10,000 small businesses were interviewed. And of those, just in the questioning process, 50% 50, 50 of those business owners say that they didn't think they would survive. So that's that's already almost a defeatist approach right at the beginning because you're, you're, you're looking at the horizon and you're saying, I honestly don't have the will in me or the power to do this. So if you've survived, uh, you have survived. That's a good thing. On the issue of community, the 50% that then uh, had hope, remember, they're just projecting forward, had hope that they would survive, felt that they could because of the strong communities that they had around them. I've heard amazing stories, and I'm sure you have, of communities across the country, across the world, that have come together to make sure that the, their local shop, their local restaurant survived, that, that came together and made contributions, that went and made sure they ordered pre-prepared meals of a period of time, not because they couldn't cook, but because it was this rally and a call to action yeah. from a community to make sure that that business survived. So. Um, I do believe that uh, those that will then proceed, if it's that we could take that research and say, let's assume 50% across the board continue to survive, you'll find that they're going to come out of this stronger. And I think it sounds uh, strange to say that, but they'll come out of this stronger. They'll come out of this um, connected even more with the communities that they're part of. And more important, they're going to come out of this um, um, less uh, intimidated of the uncertainties uh, and mm. when what change mm. is. So we, in my world, we always say to companies, change is certain. And for the last 20 years, I've always said change is certain. But there's nothing like a real crisis to remind us that change is certain. Yeah. So for those small businesses, the certainty of change means that uh, the, the process of, of, of looking at things differently and bringing new processes and new products of innovating are going to be less stressful and easier to integrate into your business processes. So what we'll, what we consider to be a traditional way of working will shift because our mindset as leaders, our mindset as business owners has now been confirmed, affirmed and strengthened through the resilient processes that we went through. And for, and, and for me, uh, I'm excited to see what comes three years from now. I think we need yeah. to weather the storm. We need to support all, every single one of us, uh, to go and hold a hand and support those 50% businesses that have survived, yeah. find ways of making sure they still employ the people that they do. Um, but at the same time, be hopeful that when they do turn around, we will get even more from those businesses as a mm. community. 
Well, I, I think it's no surprise that we see periods of, of great economic growth and innovation following periods of real crisis and hardship. And I think a lot of people are likening what potentially could happen in the, the next uh, part of the, the, the decade to what happened in the 1920s. Uh, you had the First World War, you had the Spanish flu in 1918, and that was really the roaring 20s uh, because of that hardship and the way people emerged from those crises, stronger, more resilient, uh, more connected to their communities, as you say. Uh, and, and hopefully we do follow a very similar trajectory as well. And it also reminds me of what the Michael Jackson, not uh, the singer, the, the conference speaker, Michael Jackson, loved saying at his conferences, the more things change, uh, the faster they change, not the more they stay the same. That's really the, the, the key message. Now, when we look at digital and tech, often we look at it from a, a profit bottom line perspective. How should we be viewing as, as business owners, as leaders, as entrepreneurs, tech and these tools as a way to actually better engage with our communities, our customers, and just to deliver better experiences. Because I've had some very poor online experiences and I've had online experiences that have absolutely blown me away from very small businesses. So how do you view that? It's on the certainty of change, the certainty of technology is a given. So we're not going to go away. We're not going to go back to a point where we kind of double in and out of technology in the digital economy, is it here, is it, it's not here. So it's here. So now that it's here, the question then becomes, what, what are the differentiators? So the yeah. same way we look at um, uh, different business opportunities. So the world of tech, um, for a very long time, there are investors called angel, angel investors that, that have been out there who are far removed from the traditional space. And angel, from an angel investing point of view, you see a great idea, a great technology idea, and you know that it has it's a solution that might emerge that can solve for a problem that we have. So if we look at uh, the world of tech, um, I like to break it down in three categories. One is the fintech space, which is the financial technology and inclusion around that. And in the fintech space, it's really that access to financial services. And if you look at the world of fintech and the disruptions around fintech, there was a time where uh, uh, the, the disruption in payments, um, at the moment, uh, people have forgotten that there was a time where making a payment overseas for a product uh, took you a, a whole week, sometimes two weeks, and it was cumbersome, it was complicated, yeah. then entered PayPal. And uh, it's so seamless and easy that we've forgotten that from a technology point of view, access to payments, there's been a disruption that took place and across globally has made it easy and seamless. So that seamless journey um, was started by probably youngsters who disrupted and the big banks probably sat back and said, we'll wait and see what happens. But now they themselves have brought in that innovation to become mainstream. So access to finance and democratizing that in a way that becomes a way of life is happening, and it's probably the closest to that technology disruption that we're seeing. Then there is the meditech, medical technology and enhancements around that. And I refer to that as saving lives. And I, I bring that as a, a close second because what COVID has done across the world has brought us closer to the innovations around that. So the angel investors, before you get to venture capitalists, who have invested in years in research around vaccination, uh, a research around potential um, uh, global viruses that are emerging, are smiling somewhere because some of the assumptions in the research that were, uh, many years back, what people thought they were crazy because it yeah, was just not yeah. going to happen. So from a saving lives has become something that is enabled by technology as well. We have drones at the moment that are deliver, delivering vaccines or delivering saving life, uh, chronic illness medications to remote areas. So I know, for example, in Rwanda in about 2015, I, I was partying and witnessed a process where they were testing the delivery of chronic um, cholesterol and diabetic medicine to very remote areas that you couldn't get to. That's saving wow. lives. In Nigeria and Ghana, uh, there's a young startups uh, that uh, came up with this, uh, a technology that delivers blood, a blood bank that allows using drones that can get blood real time to remote community hospitals um, at a speed of time that wouldn't be possible and in so doing saving lives. Now that's technology that's been around. So I'm using blood, I'm using chronic illnesses, but actually it's saving lives using technology that's been happening on a journey at this point in time. The third one, uh, food security, big agri-tech, agricultural technology silently behind the scenes 
unbeknownst to most people, if you look at farming, coffee farmers are, um, in, in Kenya, for example, have been now for years monitoring this, the crop over the season as with climate change, uh, it's no longer as predictable as, ooh, the sky looks blue, it's gonna be a great uh, period, or the, the rainy season is gonna flow as it should. Those things yeah. have changed. So we're using uh, predictive analytics and data and technology around that to now begin to predict the robustness of the crop that you're expecting. And that's been happening. So if you look at the, the if I to sum it up, all I'm saying is actually we are moving to a space where the use of technology and as leaders, the decisions we're going to be taking around investing in new business models, investing in processes will, will have failed if you're not factoring in the innovations at play. And more important, if you're not calculating the shifts in that very innovation. Yeah. So just because I mentioned payments and PayPal, uh, as we speak today, there is, there is a youngster sitting somewhere using all the data, collecting credit card information, who's trying to disrupt PayPal even further to make it as seamless, affordable, simple, and accessible. Yeah, it, it's remarkable the pace of this change and the convergence of all of these technologies. So you, you're now having uh, you know, telcos coming and competing with the banks, uh, offering financial services, using the information, the data that they've got to offer um, micro lending products. And I was chatting to Shamil Dusable of Vodacom the other day saying that they, with the data that they've got at their disposal, can tell your credit worthiness based on what time you use your phone first thing in the morning. And it's accurate to within um, 99%. Uh, on when you will default or whether you will default. It's just remarkable. And I think a lot more accessible than it's ever been as well because of things like the cloud and, and all of those things. Just tell me a little bit more about Systemic Logic and the various business offerings that you offer and, and where you've seen growth uh, through this particular period. I'm, I'm smiling because you're speaking to one of my favorites, uh, data, and I call it the new liquid gold over and over. I've said that. So if I look at our business and the three components that it is, by far over this pandemic, we've seen more a growth in the data side of the business. And I'll, I'll describe this, these three simple uh, parts of the business. There's a data side, an innovation side, and a, and a tech side, which is the digital disruption side. Yeah. Now, data, not airtime data. I like to be very clear and, clear, uh, and classify. It's really all the information, the collection of all the information relate, relating to uh, consumers, uh, behavior patterns, purchase patterns, uh, every single decision, uh, everything from biographic information to how you spend, as an example. So every single business at this point in time, whether it's a retailer, whether it's a hospital, doesn't uh, your footprint, your footprint in life, in everything you do, you leave information behind. Mm. So our our side of the business that looks at data, we're sitting, for example, with one of our businesses has what we call the golden source data, meaning we have the original main data of um, understanding the ERF uh, property numbers, so the property data. So a lot of the property information uh, they get from one of my businesses because uh, many years back, uh, the company, and I've actually purchased this company in the factory, um, had that somebody had the insight and the foresight of collecting the boxes that had files of information from municipalities around where houses are being registered, et cetera, and then digitize that information. Wow. So from that ERF point of view, knowing where the stands are, we now have that golden source information as an example. Now, if you take every aspect of life, anyone who's able to process all that information and is sitting, has it sitting at a point in time, is able to predict the next move. So if I were to sit and get all the information around Michael's purchase power and Michael's credit card with FNB or UPSO or Senate Bank, whichever that is, and collect that information, uh, there's no reason why today um, you can't then get your bank saying to you, geez, Michael, slow down on those coffees. You're spending too much money. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> at at uh, whatever the, your favorite coffee stand is. So the data side of the business has changed tremendously because people are looking for real-time information. So we, we're mm. finding that 
um, are we supporting uh, companies in integrating that information and then analyzing the patterns? Uh, so there's always a story in the data that you see. Yeah. And that predictive analytics then allows companies to then a, a, a preempt a pro new products or new processes. So you talk about telcos wanting to be banks and banks wanting to be telcos. Uh, the information at Telco has, for example, is very rich information that can give a sense of um, how your spending pattern is if you're a weekly, um, a monthly earner or a, a weekly laborer, or you are just received a huge bonus from a high net worth individual. There's information that can tell how you spend and where to redirect that spend, as an example. Sounds crazy, but we spend quite a bit of time at Systemic Logic with the managing processes around that information, but more important, also trying to secure as much golden source data that one can get yeah. as quickly as possible. It allows you to formulate processes and products for clients. We found that a lot of businesses sit with information but don't know where to start uh, looking at it. So data mining is something that we do. And so you data go in lake. You <laughs> mine and build data lakes out. You see, Michael, you do <laughs> And uh, go in and help with that data mining to be able to understand uh, where the, there is a leakage from a revenue point of view, where the mm. operation inefficiencies are. And more important, also from a technology point of view, understanding where your potential areas of risk are. So cyber and cyber security, we haven't spoken about that. But as we all enter the digital economy, uh, the risks also are amplified. The risk of being hacked, the risk of information going, getting in the wrong hands, yeah. the risk of, of, of uh, sharing the wrong, wrong person's information for that matter. Popia is here as a start. So uh, in that space of risk mitigation, uh, there's work that we're doing around uh, supporting around the Popia uh, pr preparation and making sure companies are ready for that. But more important, also identifying gaps uh, for cyber that you need to look into and then identify and provide input on products and technology that, that can be provided. And more important, when you wrap all that around, what Systemic Logic then does really well, is take all that information and look for areas that you can innovate. I mentioned ideation sessions. What can we, what new processes and products we can put on board and how does this layer in terms of the expectations of the customer? Because you have to wrap it constantly with a question around the so what. So yeah. what, what, what's the so what and who's the end user around that? And we, we pride ourselves or I pride myself in having taken my years of corporate and my, on, being on the other side and, and now have, being on, on the side of providing a service to say every single business, it's not about the question, so having the right question for them. It's about making sure that you confirm the question from the problem statement that they have, but yeah. then walk with them on a journey of execution. Yeah, and I, think, I, I think that's such a critical component of, uh, of arriving at the right solution is, is spending a lot of time asking and framing the, the right sort of question so that you, you're not uh, solving uh, for an answer to the, the wrong question at the end of the day. But data really does sit at the heart of all of it. Uh, there's a great uh, quote that's often uh, trotted out at uh, IT conferences, in God we trust everyone else bring data. And that, that really is the world that we're living in today. Audrey, uh, sadly, that's all the time we have for so much more still to talk about. So hopefully we can have you back on the show sometime soon to continue this uh, fantastic conversation around uh, building resilient, successful businesses that are going to emerge from this pandemic uh, stronger than before and ready to build uh, this great uh, country and continent of ours that we call home. Thanks for your time. Michael, thank you for the opportunity. It truly was a pleasure.